Okay, so today we are diving into some pretty mind-blowing physics. It is. Quaternary quantum mechanics. Yeah. QQM. It's going to be a wild ride. We're dealing with some seriously complex stuff here, but uh, yeah. But that's what these deep dives are for, right? <laughs> we'll unpack the core concepts of QQM, figure out why it's such a big deal, and hopefully have some fun along the way. It's a fascinating area of exploration, attempting to answer some of the most fundamental questions about the nature of reality. And I hear it involves some pretty wild math. It does. But before we get to that, sure. maybe we can back up a bit. I think a lot of people, myself included, find quantum mechanics itself a little tough to wrap their heads around. It's like the universe suddenly decided to play by a whole new set of rules. It certainly challenges our everyday intuition. One of the biggest hurdles is that quantum mechanics is inherently probabilistic. Unlike classical physics, where we can predict the exact trajectory of a ball, quantum mechanics deals with probabilities and possibilities. Right, like the whole idea that a particle can be in multiple states at once until we observe it. Exactly. It's enough to make your head spin. Precisely. That's the essence of the measurement problem and the collapse of the wave function. These concepts are at the heart of what makes quantum mechanics so strange and, frankly, a bit unsettling for some. Even Einstein had trouble accepting it, right? Didn't he call it spooky action at a distance? He did. The idea that the act of measurement could instantly influence the state of a particle far away was something Einstein struggled with throughout his life. Yet experiment after experiment seems to confirm that this is how the quantum world operates. So where does quaternion quantum mechanics fit into all of this? Does it make things even weirder? You could say it tries to tame the weirdness, or at least ground it in a deeper level of reality. See, quaternion quantum mechanics, or QQM, offers a different perspective, potentially providing a more complete and, dare I say, a more intuitive picture of what's happening at the quantum level. Okay, I'm intrigued. But before we go any further, can we talk about these quaternions? They sound a bit intimidating even for a math enthusiast. They're actually quite elegant once you get to know them. You see, we're all familiar with the number line, right? positive numbers, negative numbers zero in the middle. Then we learned about imaginary numbers, like the square root of minus one, denoted as i. Quaternions take this a step further by introducing not just i, but also j and k. Wait, so we're adding even more imaginary numbers to the mix? How does that even work? Well, each of these imaginary units, i, j, and k, has its own special properties. When you combine them, they interact in fascinating ways that turn out to be incredibly useful for describing rotations in three dimensions. Okay, I'm starting to see a glimmer here. It's not just about the numbers themselves, but what they can do, how they can represent complex movements and relationships. Exactly. Think of it this way. Imagine trying to describe the motion of a spinning top. You could use regular numbers, but it would be really messy. Quaternions, on the other hand, give you a much more elegant and efficient way to represent that rotation. So quaternions are like a more powerful language for talking about movement and orientation in space. Precisely. And that's what makes them so powerful for computer graphics. In fact, if you've ever seen a CGI movie with realistic-looking animation, you've already witnessed quaternions in action. That's amazing. So these mathematical objects that might hold the key to unlocking deeper mysteries of the universe are already being used to bring fantastical creatures and worlds to life on screen. Yeah. There's something kind of poetic about that. There is. But the story gets even more interesting because quaternions aren't just a convenient tool for animators. What if they're not just describing the digital worlds we create, but also the fabric of reality itself? Okay, now you've really piqued my curiosity. Mm -hmm. How do we go from CGI and spinning tops to explaining the quantum world? Well, it starts with a perhaps unexpected detour to 19th century physics and a physicist named Augustin Cauchy. Cauchy. As in Cauchy's equations, what do those have to do with quantum mechanics? You'd be surprised. This is where things get really interesting. You see, Cauchy was a pioneer in the field of elasticity. He was trying to understand how materials deform under stress and strain. So we're talking about the physics of squishy things. How does that relate to the quantum world? That's the beauty of physics. Seemingly unrelated concepts often turn out to be deeply interconnected. You see, Kashi was working with this idea of materials being continuous, even at very small scales. And guess what? Mathematical tool turns out to be incredibly good at describing how things twist, turn, and compress in a continuous medium. Don't tell me, Chuckles. Quaternions? You got it. <laughs> it's like they were tailor-made for this kind of physics. Okay, I'm following so far. Yeah. We've got quaternions, which are great at describing rotations and deformations. And yeah. we've got Kachi, who's figuring out the math of how materials behave. But how do we jump from there to the quantum realm with its particles and probabilities? That's where things get truly mind-bending. 
we need to introduce a model called the Planck-Kleinert crystal. Imagine space itself not as empty, but as a kind of incredibly fine-grained crystal lattice made up of tiny vibrating particles at the Planck scale. Well, hold on, the Planck scale. Mm. We're talking about sizes so small that they make atoms look gigantic, uh, right? Exactly. To give you an idea, if an atom were the size of the observable universe, a Planck particle would be about the size of a tree. Okay, that's incredibly tiny. So space is this vibrating crystal made up of these unimaginably small Planck particles. And this is where quaternion quantum mechanics comes in. Precisely. Because in QQM, it's the vibrations of these Planck particles, their interactions with each other, that we perceive as particles and waves at our much larger scale. Whoa. So everything we see and experience all of reality as we know it is just the result of these tiny particles doing a cosmic dance at the Planck scale. It's a mind-boggling concept, isn't it? And this is where Kochi's work on elasticity and the elegance of quaternions converge in a truly remarkable way. So we've got these Planck particles vibrating away at scales that are almost impossible to imagine. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And somehow those vibrations create everything we experience, matter, energy, even space itself. It's one of the most profound implications of QQM, this idea that reality as we know it emerges from a deeper, more fundamental level of vibrations. Like those vibrating particles of the universe's symphony orchestra. Right. And we're just hearing the grand music they produce, not the individual notes. That's a beautiful analogy. And what's even more remarkable is that we might be able to connect this picture to the familiar equations of quantum mechanics. You mean like the Schrodinger equation, the one that's yeah. supposed to describe how particles behave at the quantum level? The very same. You see, traditionally, quantum mechanics just presents the Schrodinger equation as a given, a starting point. But QQM might offer a way to actually derive it from a more fundamental level of physics. Wait, you're saying we might be able to explain where that equation comes from, not just that it works. Exactly. And it all comes back to those vibrating Planck particles and the elegant way quaternions describe their interactions. Okay, I'm on the edge of my seat here. Walk me through it. Okay, so remember how we talked about Kachi and his work on elasticity? Well, it turns out that when you describe the physics of those vibrating Planck particles using quaternions, taking into account how they push and pull on each other in this Planck-Kleinert crystal, something amazing happens. Do tell. Certain patterns emerge mathematical relationships that look remarkably familiar. You mean? We start to see the Schrodinger equation pop out naturally from the math. And that's huge. It suggests the Schrodinger equation isn't just some arbitrary rule we've imposed on the universe, but rather a consequence of a deeper, more fundamental level of reality described by QQM. Wow, so it's like we're peering behind the curtain and seeing the machinery that makes quantum mechanics tick. Precisely. And it's not just the Schrodinger equation. QQM might also shed light on other mysteries of the quantum world, like why imaginary numbers show up in so many of our equations. Okay, imaginary numbers have always been a bit of a head-scratcher for me. They're called imaginary for a reason, right? Right. They often feel like a mathematical trick rather than something physically meaningful. But in the context of QQM, they might take on a whole new significance. How so? Well, remember those three imaginary units we talked about, I, J, and K? They're not just abstract mathematical entities in QQM. They're directly related to the way those Planck particles are vibrating and interacting with each other. So the imaginary nature of those numbers might actually reflect a fundamental aspect of how reality is structured at the Planck scale. Exactly. It's like those imaginary numbers are trying to tell us something profound about the universe all along, and QQM might be the key to finally understanding their message. This is incredible. But it's all still theoretical, right? Is anyone right. actually tested any of these ideas? Oh, that's the million dollar question. The paper you shared does mention some potential avenues for experimental verification. Like what? Well, one physicist, Sabine Hassenfelder, has proposed an intriguing experiment involving extremely strong gravitational fields. Okay, how did that work? The idea is that if space really is this Planck-Kleinert crystal, then at extremely high energies, like those found near black holes, the discrete nature of space might become apparent. So we're talking about looking for tiny glitches in the matrix kind of thing. In a way, yes. These glitches would be extremely subtle, but if we could detect them, it would be a major victory for QQM. So the jury's still out, but the potential payoff is huge. Yeah. What other mysteries might QQM help us solve? Well, one of the biggest mysteries in physics is how to reconcile quantum mechanics with gravity. Right, because those two seem to hate each other, don't they? Like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Exactly. They operate on such different scales and with such different assumptions about the nature of reality. But QQM might offer a way to bridge that gap. Potentially, yes. 
You see, in QQM, gravity might not be a fundamental force at all, but rather an emergent property of this vibrating Planck scale crystal. Okay, now you've really lost me. How can gravity, something that holds planets in orbit, just emerge from something else? It's a bit like how the flow of water molecules creates currents and waves in the ocean. Individually, the water molecules are just doing their own thing. But collectively, their behavior gives rise to these larger scale patterns and forces. So you're saying gravity might be a kind of collective behavior of these Planck particles? That's the idea. It's a radical shift in perspective, but it's one of the exciting possibilities that QQM offers. This is blowing my mind. So we've got a potential explanation for the Schrodinger equation, a new way to think about imaginary numbers and maybe even a path towards unifying quantum mechanics and gravity. Is there anything QQM can't do? Well, it's still early days, but it's certainly a promising avenue of research with the potential to revolutionize our understanding of the universe. It certainly seems that way. Before we get too carried away, though, there's one thing I keep coming back to. What's that? If this QQM picture is accurate, if everything really is just the result of these tiny Planck particles vibrating away, what does that mean for our understanding of reality? Are we just vibrations? That's a profound question, and one that philosophers have been grappling with for centuries. Yeah, it really makes you think, doesn't it? Like, what if everything we see and touch and experience is just the result of these tiny particles vibrating in this way that's just beyond our comprehension? It really challenges our fundamental assumptions about the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. Are we these distinct entities separate from the world, or are we like QQM suggests inseparable parts of this grand interconnected cosmic dance? You know, it's funny you should say that. It's like that old saying, all that we see in this world is like a reflection in a drop of water. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, maybe those ancient mystics were onto something. But even if QQM doesn't completely rewrite our understanding of reality, I think it at least gives us this exciting new way to look at the universe and how it all works. It does. It's about pushing the boundaries of what we think is possible and opening ourselves up to new ways of seeing the world. Speaking of new ways of seeing the world, there's one more thing I wanted to touch on before we wrap up. We talked about how QQM might be this bridge between quantum mechanics and gravity. Yeah, that's right. The holy grail of modern physics. Exactly. But um, I have to admit, I'm still having trouble picturing it. How can something like gravity that shapes galaxies emerge from something as tiny as these Planck particles? It's a tough one to visualize, for sure. Here, let's try an analogy. Imagine a big sheet of rubber stretched out tight. Now put a bowling ball right in the middle. What happens? Okay, so the sheet curves downward around the ball, right? Creating this kind of dip. Exactly. Now let's say that the sheet is space-time and the bowling ball is a massive object, like a star. I'm with you so far. So the bowling ball warps the fabric of space-time around it, right? And that warping is what we experience as gravity. Okay, so where does QQM come into all of this? Well, in QQM, space-time isn't smooth and continuous like that rubber sheet. It's granular made up of those tiny Planck particles we've been talking about. Right, the planck kleinert crystal. Exactly. Now picture those Planck particles constantly bumping into each other, vibrating, exchanging energy. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Now, when you introduce a massive object into the picture, it's going to disrupt that flow of energy within the planck kleinert crystal. So it's like the bowling ball, but instead of just warping a sheet, it's actually messing with the energy flow within the crystal itself. You got it. And it's that disruption, that unevenness in how the energy is distributed that we experience as gravity. Wow. So gravity isn't really a force. Oh. In the way we usually think of it. It's more like a consequence of how mass and energy interact with the very fabric of space-time at the Planck scale. That's the heart of how QQM reimagines gravity. It's a big change from how we traditionally viewed it, but it has the potential to finally unify the two biggest ideas in physics. It's incredible when you think about it. It all started with quaternions, these elegant mathematical objects that William Rowan Hamilton discovered while walking across a bridge. It just goes to show the power of human curiosity and how seemingly different areas of study can connect in surprising ways. Exactly. Who knew that the math we use to create lifelike animations in movies could unlock such deep mysteries about the universe? And on that note, I think we're going to wrap up this deep dive into quaternion quantum mechanics. Hopefully we've given everyone a lot to think about. We've only scratched the surface of this topic, but I think we've at least sparked some curiosity and hopefully inspired some further exploration. To all our listeners out there, if you want to go deeper into this fascinating topic, be sure to check out the paper we discussed today, along with the work of Sabine Hassenfelder and her ideas for testing QQM. 
And who knows, maybe someday some of you will be the ones pushing the boundaries of physics and unlocking even bigger secrets about the universe. Until then, keep asking questions, keep exploring, and never stop challenging the limits of what we think we know.